The nature of warfare hasn't changed, okay? It, war's brutal, it's people, a clash of wills, it's ugly. But the character of warfare has changed. You know, the last 20 years we've been engaged in a land-centric campaign where we've had air supremacy, we've owned the air. The difference though is that now the national defense strategy and, and the, just the, the demands of the world around us force us to change the character of warfare and what we prepare for to warfare with a state actor, with another, with a peer competitor. And when you fight a peer competitor, you have to change how you command and control air power because just like we can threaten many, many th targets within an adversary nation, they can threaten us. And if they threaten our ability to command and control air power the old way, then we won't be effective. We apply military power by control and exploitation of the air domain. We control the air. And through the air, we can do a lot. We can do global reach. We can reach anywhere and do create mobility anywhere. We can do uh, global village vigilance, which is where we can look and see and observe things on the earth, observe the adversary. And of course, we can do global power, which is where we apply force against the adversaries to hold targets at risk. Up on the surface, at sea, deeply buried, in the air, that's what the Air Force does. What we've moved to is three tenets, centralized command, distributed control, and decentralized execution. And a single centralized air commander provides the best military advice for all things in the air domain. It doesn't just have to be U.S. Air Force air power. It could be naval air power, marine air power, coalition air power. And it gives options to the Joint Force Commander and subsequently to the President. And so distributed control is all about resilience. It, it allows us to continue to manage the air war, but not have it in a single physical facility. And, uh, and then lastly, the, you know, the, the final tenet hasn't changed. It's decentralized execution. You know what that is? That's called empowerment. You want to have the latitude of doing your job. And so when you're a flight leader or package commander out there with a group of fighters, you have rules of engagement, you have spins, special instructions, you have an AOD, Air Operations Directive, you have guidelines that set the limits of what you can do and also enable you to go after things that are dynamic that happen out there. It could be an air battle manager that goes, okay, I know the big, I know this was the original intent, but the adversary is coming at us in a different direction here. I need to refocus this. And he's empowered to do so without making that phone call back. Okay, so it's very important that the commander articulate the, his mission orders, the mission intent, very clearly so that there are limits on what the subordinates actually are enabled to do so that we don't stumble into something that we hadn't planned or exceed some political boundary or some strategic boundary that we don't want to. We think of it like this, there's risk in this mission command approach, in this empowerment approach. There's risk, but there's a lot more risk if we don't do it. If an airman goes, hey, I'm not going to pick up that wrench because I don't know if they want me to fix this airplane or not, that's a problem. Yes, airman, we want you to fix that airplane. Even though I'm not telling you, I want you to fix every airplane out there. I want you to gas them all up. I want you to fix them. I want you to put this ordinance on them, and I want you to keep them ready. We, not, we don't know what's going to happen, but we want you to do this. You're empowered to do it. I think people want to operate in that kind of environment. And so the risk of not embracing mission command, the risk of not uh, using centralized command, distributed control, and decentralized execution far exceeds the risk of actually doing it.